Get the, you want to say hi to everybody? Say hi. You want to wave? Say hello. There you go. Yeah, you think about it. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. There you go. Liam's waving. Yay. So we're going to keep him for like 72 hours before his mama gets here. And we're having a great time. He's so good. He's a good boy. We all love Liam. He's a good man. Can you say Papa? Papa? Say Papa? Say hello. Yeah, Papa? Papa? Can you say it? Can you say KK? That's what he calls Kathy, KK. He's waving at her. All right, that's enough of that. That's our announcement for tonight. All right, go back to KK. You want to show them how you walk? Okay, yeah, we won't go down the stairs. That's true. There you go. Let me show everybody how he walks. Now, there he goes. And believe me, he's faster than you think. And when he gets on the living room floor and then he's gone and he's like, I want to eat cat food. And I'm like, no, come back. So, hey, we got our last Camp Fuel coming up this Wednesday from 10 to noon. So we've had a great summer. And Ashlyn's done a great job, and she's headed off to nursing school. And so uh, next Sunday will be her last Sunday with us as she goes back to school. So if you know anyone who wants to bring their child to Camp Fuel one last time, this is an opportunity. It's free, and we're having a great time. And it's going to be uh, Children and Parents Day. So a lot of these moms have enjoyed having a break from 10 to noon. And we've had fun with the kids, so they've been fun. And I think that's about it. We're going to try movie night again this coming weekend. Hopefully we'll have weather that cooperates. If it starts getting windy after about 15 miles an hour, it's just impossible to hold that screen in place. So we're looking at things that we're going to do in the future so we won't have to be pulling the screen anyway. All right, well, Father, thank you so much for this night. We pray, Lord, as we worship you that your Holy Spirit will speak to us, that you will uh, come to life in us, Lord, just revive us. And bring to us a, a joy, because the joy of the Lord is our strength. And so we pray that you'll renew our strength as we rejoice in you. Thank you for this time. Lord, pray your blessings upon David and Cheryl as they lead us in the worship. Lord, that your blessings will be upon them as you use them as your instruments to encourage and bring forth a praise in us. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. All right, <clears throat> well, good evening, everyone. If you would, take a songbook and see if you can locate 499. 499, I will sing the wondrous story. 499. has already prayed to open our services, but it, uh, let's take a moment and uh, pray again. Uh, there's a, a couple of three prayer requests that we need to remember. 
Uh, one of them is a young man that's in military service, a young man who's in London, England, or in England, uh, sir, uh, in the Air Force. His name is Walker Gladden, and uh, that is a friend of Linda Kyle's, a co-worker of Linda Kyle's. That's her son, uh, and he has thyroid cancer and will be having surgery in the morning. And then secondly, let's pray for Kyle Chambliss. Kyle is undergoing some tests and trying to figure out what's going with him. That's Jennifer's husband and uh, really, really concerned about him. And then thirdly, there is a young uh, girl by the name of Ryan Jones. Is that right? Ryan. Ryan, R-Y-O-N, six years old. She's had cancer or she was diagnosed with cancer at age two. And uh, there's some blood work has come and tests have come back not looking good. And they'll be doing some testing this week. Is that correct? Yeah, they're doing some blood work and they're asking us to pray for them. Yeah. Because they're going to be starting about the third or fourth week of October. Yeah. So we can pray that it's not too late. Okay. Yeah, that's a little one that is very, very dear to Zeta. Okay. So let's take a moment. Let's just pray for those and then others that are on our prayer list as well. Father, we come to you tonight thanking you for your blessings and thanking you for these that are faithful to come into your house, Lord, and to worship you. Father, but we come to you tonight specifically for Walker Gladden. Pray with for him as he has surgery tomorrow. Pray that the surgery will be successful. Father, that the cancer would be eradicated. Pray for his mom as she is there with him and as she travels back and forth. Father, we pray for Kyle Chambliss, Father, and Jennifer and that family. Uh, pray, Father, for comfort and strength through that. And, Father, Jennifer is so, so very concerned. And just pray that it is not as serious as they're anticipating it may be. And then, Father, we pray for this little six-year-old girl, Ryan Jones, Father, that as they are doing the scans and whatever, we pray that there's not anything serious there. Be with her and her family and those that are dear to her, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> All right, 503. 503. Cheryl and I have been here three or four years now, and I don't think we've ever sang the previous song, and I don't think we've ever sang this one since we've been here. So at least three or four years since you've sang this one, since Jesus came in heart. <clears throat> That's all to 
Mrs. Chan, Mrs. Chan she said every time she comes in on a sunny night, she has allergy problems, and so she's cured up, and she's giving them to me. So blame it all on Chan. All right. <laughs> all right, 543. 543 till the storm passes by. much. Those are great hymns. Some that I haven't heard in quite a while. Glad to hear them again. Good hymns, good times of worship. You know, I think I, the thing I appreciate so much about the hymns is they bring back great memories of moments in church and uh, sermons and pastors and preachers, evangelists. They seem to bring back a recall that's good and it's healthy for us to remember. Those hymns are uh, spiritual markers for us that give us all kinds of insight and guidance into the truth of Christ and His Word and also doctrine of God and then uh, good memories of God's faithfulness in the past. May we find His faithfulness in our present situation. We're going to look again in Psalm 91 tonight. We're looking at the shadows of safety and uh, beginning of that in verses 1 and 2 we read an interesting uh, concept or idea about God, and that is that he cast a shadow. He cast a shadow, and there's uh, four places that he 
uh, cast a shadow that we find in the scripture. We see a rock. Jesus Christ describes himself as a rock. Upon this rock I'll build my church. The concept and idea of a rock is also like that of a mountain or a great uh, rock formation uh, that comes forth from the ground and it casts a shadow. It's a place of uh, coolness and refuge and, and uh, protection, especially out in the desert in the hot sun, dry places. Mountains also provide uh, water uh, as the snow melts and uh, the water comes forth. So the rock is a formation that brings about comfort and, and rest and refreshment and stability. A rock doesn't easily move. When we're talking about a huge rock formation or a mountain, uh, they don't just move with great ease. And the other thing is uh, the split rock, as we talked about, how it opened up and brought just a huge geyser of fresh water in the desert, rain onto the land, and then they had a big water reservoir, and there was living water that came forth from the ground, an artesian well of living water. It's not stagnant. Uh, it's not uh, something that you have to filter. It comes forth from the ground fresh and, and ready to drink. And so Jesus Christ says the rock is also uh, the living water. That it's a shadow that's expressed in uh, Psalm chapter, uh, Solomon, Song of Solomon chapter 2, the tree. And in it, the tree is also referred to, in the, especially in the book of Acts, as the cross. And they use the term tree as a evangelistic way of reaching the Jew because the cross was a Roman Gentile instrument of death. However, it was made from a tree and in Deuteronomy chapter 23 it talks about the rebellious son being crucified on a tree. Christ who was not rebellious, our rebellion was laid on him. He died in our place and therefore we see a reference there of the tree. And for the, uh, for the Jew, they very much understood the crucifixion on a tree. So there's a tree that casts a shadow, and we're in the shadow of the cross today. Then we saw also the shadow in the wings. And it talks about how God's wings, it says right there in Psalm 1, it says, uh, He shall cover you, verse 4, He shall cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you shall take refuge. And again, we see a reference to that in Luke 13, 34. In Matthew 23, 37, we see the imagery there of a bird, and it's in contrast to the fowler. And we'll look at that in just a moment. This is contrast. So we see uh, God escapes the hand of the snares of the fowler, and he's a, uh, there's imagery of paternal care there in the wings as the mother hen cast her wings over the chicks and keeps them safe and keeps them from the view of the hawk and keeps them safe in the sun and guides them to places of protection. We have those shadows over us as well, God's wings of concern and care, his parenting and the way he takes care of us. And then the shadow of his hand, which we just sang in that hymn, the hand of God. The hand is always a symbol of protection, also a symbol of blessing. The right hand is always uh, the prominent place, the place of uh, uh, privilege when you're at the right hand of the Father. So these are four physical, tangible things that for the Hebrew he can see that cast a shadow. And that we're talking about an almighty God, a living God, and he makes his presence known. So we see him in the rock, the tree, the wings, and the hand. All of these which uh, give us an idea of of Christ's imagery and his protection because Jesus even refers to this very thought as I mentioned over in uh, Luke 13:34 and Matthew 23:37 about the wings and then they talk about can I sit at the right hand of you he said that's not mine to decide but the father so we see that Jesus Christ has a position of privilege for his disciples and the tree of course is our salvation so he says that we're to find both are abiding in that shadow, the secret place, the covering of Jesus Christ of the Most High shall abide under the shadow. The word abide means for us to make home. Abide means we make home. We stay so long that it becomes home for us. 
If, uh, if little Liam stayed with us long enough, he would see us as his home away from home. Uh, you know, I think he's beginning to wonder where his mama is. So she's going to show up tomorrow and he'll be in a better mood, I think. But if he stayed long enough, his memory faded, what would happen? He would begin to cling to us, look to us at that young age. The idea of abiding in the shadow of the Almighty is that same idea of making home and this is your home in the midst of this world, that the shadow of the Almighty is your home. Because it gives you a reference. It protects you. It shields you. A shadow covers you. It shields you. It gives you a reference point. If you know that you're in the shadow, then you know you're in the proximity of God. You're not lost. If you're in the shadow, you know you're not lost. If you can't find the shadow of the Lord, you're, where am I? You're lost. <laughs> and a lot of people straying around, walking around right now, out from under the shadow of the Almighty, they're lost. They think they can find their way, but they have no point of reference. God is always our point of reference. And all four of these images that we see in the, New, in the Old Testament are references that cast a shadow, a tangible, real shadow, and they're references to God's faithfulness in our lives. So we have to abide in that. And that shadow is a place of protection. It gives us a sense of security. I know I'm in the presence of my Father. I know He casts a shadow and protects me. I know He's there. I know He's close by. And that shadow gives a close proximity. And the ultimate shadow that we're all covered in today is the cross, the tree. It's the most prevalent event in the life of Jesus Christ. And it casts a shadow for us. It gives us everything. The shadow points us to the empty tomb. The empty tomb points us to his ascension into heaven. And the Lord's Supper that we took today points us to his return. He's coming back. And so he's very real. Now I want us to look at it for just a few moments here at the next passage here in verses 5 and 6. Well, let's start with verse 3. He says, Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers. Under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. Now, so in these passages here, we have a promise that as we have him as our refuge, that is our place of safety in the storm, and a fortress, which is a fortified castle, well, that would be heaven. Heaven is a fortified place. It's there to protect us. But Jesus is also our fortress. He covers us from top to bottom and all around the sides. Christ is our fortress. We abide in Him. We're hidden in Him. And the idea of being in Him means to be surrounded top, bottom, all around our sides with His protection. He's a fortress. No one can bring down that fortress. And He's also a refuge. He's our hope in the storm. We see Jesus as a refuge in those passages in the gospel where He uh, bails out literally his disciples in the storm so he says my God in him I will trust my God being the father in him being Jesus will I trust this is very close in verse 2 there at the end of verse 2 very close to what God says at his point of transfiguration there's Moses there's Elijah and there's Jesus and God says this is my son listen to him here he says, my God, in him I will trust. In him being Jesus, his son, I will trust. Why? Because he's the secret place that's been revealed from the prophecies. So he says, surely he shall deliver you. The word deliver means to rescue or to save. Same word that we see in the New Testament. The idea of deliverance is salvation. And salvation from all types of perils. We think of salvation as only heaven but it's salvation from our three enemies the world the flesh and the devil he defeats all three god is the creator of this world he defeats the world how does god the father defeat the world he sends his son his son defeated satan on the cross and what did jesus christ do for us he brought the holy spirit to give us control over our flesh. So all three of these enemies have been addressed. All three have been defeated. And it says, if you look, he says, He shall deliver, 
future tense, you from the snare of the fowler, for us we have been delivered. It's no longer past tense for us. I mean, uh, present tense for us, it's past tense. He's done it. And from perilous pestilence. So we see a snare of the fowler. Who's the fowler? That's Satan. That's one who catches birds in a trap or a snare. Uh, it's trickery. It's a form of uh, temptation. All temptation is, is setting a trap. It's setting a trap with bait. So when you think of this salvation, you escape the snare. The snare is a form of temptation. It's setting a trap with a bait. Whatever bait attracts you. It could be anything. It could be money, it could be lust, it could be popularity, it could be power. Whatever bait reels you in. Uh, and you've heard me say this, my, my uncle Bert, he never liked to buy uh, commercial baits when he would go fishing. He built his own baits and he had his little workshop in there, little small uh, workshop. He had drill bits and dremel tools and he created his own topwater baits. He never fished with a worm, he never fished with anything else. And he would paint all these outrageous looking um, baits. And I said, Uncle Bert, that's the most crazy looking thing. He goes, that's the one that catches the most. I said, why? Why would a bass hit that thing? I said, that thing's ugly and it's crazy. It's got hot pink all over it and everything. He said, you won't see this in any bait store. He goes, that's why they hit it. Because it's something different. He said, they think it's something new. And boy, he would. He'd hit them. He'd catch them. He'd Tear him out of that river all the time. You funked a river down the road from his house in Covington, Louisiana. Well, that's what the devil does. It's all about, it's like fishing. It's like hunting. They bait the fields with corn. They wait for the deer to come. They have their blind. They wait for the duck to show up. They got the decoys. Whatever hunting you're doing, you're snaring, you're tricking your prey, the one you're hunting, you're deceiving it and getting it comfortable in a dangerous environment. That's what a snare, that's what a fowler does. He traps the birds, they get familiar, and then he locks the trap, he's got them. And a lot of times they're self, uh, self-made traps. They take the bait and it pulls the, it pulls the uh, wire and crabs them by the leg. And that's what Satan does. And he says, he'll deliver you from that. Well, how does he deliver you from that? When you abide under the shadow of the Almighty, under the shadow of his safety. But if we get out from under that shadow, we're going to get snared every time. That fowler's going to be there. Here you go. You don't know where you are. You come over here. I got something for you. And it's all setting traps. That's all in the world this is. That's what he's talking about. And from perilous pestilence. So look at that. Two things we see. We see satanic trappings like a fowler, des- deliberate deception, a plan that's laid out, and then also perilous pestilence. These are circumstances and plagues. So we see a deliverance both from the temptations of Satan, his snares, and then also pestilence and snares and, and plagues, pestilence and plagues. We have all kinds of pestilence and plagues today, don't we? You know, one of the great pestilence that we have today is uh, a snare of trapping people in their words. And it's like a pestilence. On public social media, you say something, and if it's written in a way that somebody doesn't like, they're all over it. Well, you need to apologize for this. Uh, You need to ask for forgiveness. How many people do you see that are always asking for forgiveness all the time for saying something that's true? Don't apologize for the truth. And most of this stuff you see on social media, it's fake anyway. It's a bunch of bots. It's not even people. Well, you saw uh, Elon Musk, he wanted to buy Twitter. He said, well, how many people do you actually got subscribed to Twitter? And they wouldn't tell him. Well, because the numbers are deceptive. They're all fake accounts. They're not real people. He said, I'm out of this. If you can't tell me how many people you literally got signed up, You're not getting my millions of dollars, and now they want to take him to court for it. They want to take him to court for lying to all of us about how many millions of people they got following on Twitter. Hardly anybody I know is on Twitter. They used to be, but they're not anymore. Most people I know don't have anything to do with it. It's deception. It's a plague. 
And then there's perilous pestilence as well. There's circumstances in the environment that come upon us, and he protects us. He protects his people as long as we stay in the shadow of the Almighty. And look, it reinforces this. He says, he shall cover you, future tense, with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. Same word that you see in verse 2 is now reinforced in verse 4. Why? Because he's giving us another physical representation of the way he cast his shadows. That his feathers, his wings over you, that's that parental guidance. So he takes care of his little chicks. You're like a little chick, like a little baby in the presence of the Almighty God, and he's protecting you. This is a beautiful image, by the way. If you think about it, if you've ever been around, most of you have, you've been around these chickens with their little chicks, and those little chicks, you just, you know, you just love them, don't you? It's just a little bitty yellow thing running around and some of them different colors, and they're, they're chirping for their mother, and they want protection, and she comes over and puts those wings over and protects them. And it's just a beautiful image of great love and compassion for the helpless, for the defenseless, for the needy. And we're all that way. There's, there's things in this world we cannot protect ourselves against. We must have our Heavenly Father's protection. There's just certain things we can't control. And so he comes in and he takes control. And he protects us. He watches over us. And it also tells us that he's not forgotten you. And sometimes we think, man, I feel so frail and so fragile. And I feel like, you know, the next big thing that comes along, it's just going to blow me over, knock me over, and I'm going to be roadkill. But the Heavenly Father's watching over you. He's got his wings stretched out. And he continues to do that until the day you die and calls you home. And he's just a, a magnificent God. And this imagery that we're seeing here is one of great compassion. And you're also seeing him involved in the minute details of people's lives. Because you see the big picture many times in the Old Testament. You see these great movements as he brings his people out of Egypt and across the Red Sea and into the desert and before Mount Sinai. They get the Ten Commandments and it's all about the mass. But then it also comes down to the individual. And so he's telling you, I've got my hand, I'm, wa I'm watching over you. My shadow of safety is over you. And the word there, refuge, again comes back to that word that we looked at uh, last uh, S Sunday, uh, Wednesday. It's a shelter of hope in a storm. The refuge is a shelter of hope in a storm. When the little chicks are out there and the ba bad weather comes, the wings come out and she takes them to a place of refuge. It's a shelter of hope in a storm. And hope is an expectation. And he says, your truth, this is the word of God. Now we're getting into the words of God. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. The shield being a protection. What does it say? Paul says in Ephesians that the word of God is what? It's like a shield. It's a protection. A shield of faith. Where do you get your faith? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Your shield of faith comes by hearing the word of God. He says, your truth shall be your shield. His truth shall be your shield. Well, the way it becomes a shield for you is when it is expressed in faith. It's merely words until we live it, until we believe it and do it. And when you believe it and do it, it becomes a shield, a protection. A protection, he says, and look what he says, it protects. Do not be afraid of the terror by night. Have you ever been out in a really dark place and you don't have any electricity and all you got is a battery operated light or a campfire going by and you hear something out there in the woods and it's pretty terrifying. He said, you shall not be afraid of the terror by night. You shall not be. It's a, it's a, it's a promise. When you're in the shadow of his safety, there's nothing too dark in the night to scare you. His shadow is covering you even in the darkness. The presence of God covers you in that darkness. Years ago, I was up in, I was climbing King's Peak up in uh, Utah. I was by myself. And uh, there was a camp, a base camp that was ahead. And it's a long haul. It's about 10 or 12 mile hike from the, from the front gate to there. And I got lost getting to the park. I got lost finding the trail. And by the time I got started, it was about 2 in the afternoon. It was getting late. And by the time I, I the sun was about to go down, I had to stop. And I stopped just shy of this camp. 
I was about another two miles going in, and I should have gone further. I should have just trekked my way in the darkness to get there. But I didn't, and I built my tent. It was a little stream nearby. So I said, well, I'll just settle down for the night here. I've got time that I can put my tent up and cook something and eat and go to bed. And I don't know what time it was, but it wasn't real late. It was dark, though. And all of a sudden, uh, it was a group of coyotes that were yelping and carrying on outside my tent. And it got scary. And I took my headlamp, uh, and I started talking out loud, and it got real quiet. But you could hear them rustling around out there. And I put my headlamp on, and I turned it on, and I unzipped my tent and opened it up, and I saw just dozens of glowing eyes looking back at me. So I just sang hymns for a long time. And I don't think it was the hymns that scared them off as much as it was my singing that scared them off. But the next day, I ran into a couple of uh, moose that were fighting, and it was a, it's not a safe place out there. When you're by yourself in the wilderness, uh, a, a noise in the dark can strike terror. And I'm telling you, one of, it started with a yelp that sounded like a baby crying. And when you're in the total darkness and you hear something sound like a baby crying, uh, it, it terrified me. My heart rate, I feel my heart going up thinking about it. It was, it was, it was not a comfortable thing. And then coming down, I ran into a... Uh, um, what do they call those rascals? A big, big animal. Anyway, he's not big, but he's dangerous. A wolverine. Ran into a wolverine. He tried to bite the front tires of a car that I rented as I was leaving. Because he had to park out in the field. And he came out. I saw these bushes moving. And it was a wolverine. I said, oh, that's cool, a wolverine. And then he went after the front tire. And I thought, good night. He's not afraid of anything. <laughs> oh, they bring down a grizzly bear. All right, I'm glad I didn't uh, meet him in the open. And then he says, nor the arrow that flies by day. So you will not be terror, afraid of terror in the night. So you hear something that sounds like a baby crying in the middle of the night, like a scary baby. You're not, you're not to be afraid. And the arrow that flies by day, that's a terrifying thing when they were on the battlefield and they saw a hail of, of a rain of these arrows coming down upon them. Well, what did they use to protect themselves? The shield. So it goes back into the context of a shield. The shield of faith is your protection. And they were like uh, rectangles. They're not round. They're rectangular, and they're long. They're like a door, and it actually refers to that as a door. And as you get locked in with the soldiers in front of you, behind you, and beside you, you all create a roof over your head as a rain of these things come down, these arrows come down, a lot of them flaming arrows. And he says, you're not to be afraid of the arrow that flies by day. This rain of, of danger and death that's coming down from the sky. Nor the pestilence that walks in darkness. There's a pestilence that walks in darkness. It's a thing that shows up that's in the darkness. It could be a bear. It could be a lion. It could be anything that comes along. It's dangerous. You know, you're not to be afraid of it. It tells us that David fought the bear and the lion. He grabbed hold of them. He grabbed them by the hand. He killed those things. He killed them by the sling as well. Nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday. It lays waste. The word waste there means it spoils everything. This ties very closely too to John 3.16. If you look at it, he says that your, your life, that you will not uh, be, destro be destroyed. He says, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The word perish means to waste or spoil in, in the Old Testament. So there you see a connection there as well. And, and Christ was at the top of his suffering at noonday. And the world thought he was destroyed as he was dying on the cross. But you know, he wasn't afraid of the terror at night when he was on the trial. And he wasn't afraid of the arrows that flew by day when Pilate sentenced him. And he was not afraid of the pestilence and the darkness of the crowd and the mob that wanted him dead. Nor did he have destruction at noonday when he hung on the cross. He wasn't afraid. He's our shield and our buckler now. And a thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Jesus Christ hung from the cross he saw 10,000 at his right hand mocking and jeering at him, but he also saw the reward of the wicked as they hung him on a cross. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, 
for they know not what they do. Well, I had more to say, but I'm going to close it there. Father God, thank you so much for tonight, and thank you for the shadow of your safety. And no matter how dark it looks on the outside, and no matter how overwhelming pestilence seems to be, the shadow of your wings cover us. And the shadow of the cross is our hope. And it points us to the empty tomb, and the empty tomb causes us to look up to watch you come back on the clouds, to return, to take us from this weary, sad, broken world. But we have victory in this world, and we can walk with confidence in this world because we walk in your shadow, and your shadow always gives us comfort, reassurance, and strengthens our faith. Help us, Lord, to look for your shadow in our lives every day. Your shadows of protection, your shadows of provision, your shadows of hope, and your shadows of love. And Lord, help us cast that same shadow to those who need the touch of your compassion. Let us cast the shadow of the Almighty to those around us, that they can find hope and salvation in the shadow of the tree. It is in Christ.